Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to World at War Comics. My next two amazing guests um, represent Critical Entertainment. We have Chris Rita and we have Tad Galusha. Guys, it is so awesome to have you on. Can't wait to talk about American, uh, the first Americans, which I absolutely love from the last time Chris was here. We have issue two right here. Um, and Tad, it's cool to have you on as well, because I was gushing with uh, Chris over your artwork the last time I had him on, man. Uh, but man, Critical Entertainment, you guys are dropping all kinds of cool stuff. Um, but how are you guys doing? Are we good? Doing Go ahead, real Tad. good. Doing <laughs> real good. And I like it. I like the, you know, the the compliments of the artwork. You can just yeah, keep yeah, that exactly. going just full time. Just, yeah, I like that. Yeah, doing good. Doing really good. Awesome, gents. Well, um, I kind of wanted to dig in right away and, and talk about um, the first Americans um, since we have you on, Tad. Uh, and maybe real quick, Chris, if we could start with you. Um, I've looked it over and I've read both of them. But if you could kind of give us a synopsis for people that are listening in as to what they could expect with the first Americans, I think that'll set the tone and then we could get into some of the artwork that supports that. Right, right. So uh Basically, the elevator pitch is uh, set 14,000 years ago, and it follows a tribe of Paleo-Indians as they travel from Siberia into North America for the very first time. Boom. That's it. <laughs> I love it. That's man. it. That's it. <laughs> so we're, do dealing with, uh, we're doing, dealing with pre prehistoric uh, elements and what it's kind of like to enter North America for the very first time and dealing with all the different megafauna and all the different plants and animals you're dealing with. So how did, where did this idea, where was it born, Chris? And how did you come up with it? Uh, so basically, uh, I've been working with Tad. We did we did a short called, you know, The Cowboy with Many Hats that came out uh, last year. Yeah. And basically, I went to him and I was like, what type of stories would you like to tell? Uh, let's try to collaborate. And then uh, he basically, you know, being up in Alaska... Uh, he's interested in like paleo Indian culture. And so basically I just did a bunch of research and I was like, let me look this stuff up. And a story kind of developed as I was doing research and everything just kind of fell into place. And, you know, kind of pitched this idea to Tad and we worked together to kind of make this come to life. It's so awesome. And then Tad, I mean, living there up in Alaska, we were just talking before we hit recording. I did live up there for about a year, so I don't have your experience. Um, but everything that Chris was talking about is so prevalent wherever you go, especially within that area, as far yeah. as, um, you know, people that are the rightful people of that portion of the country, right? Um, yeah. Can I talk about uh, your experience and how that played into this as well? Yeah, you know, uh, like like when Chris approached me with the project, uh, I was uh, he gave me like a list of different you know like these are some different uh, projects we're thinking about doing. Is there any of these that meet the fancy? And um, I at the time I was doing a a book called Cretaceous for Oni, uh, and it was all you know like uh, Mesozoic animals uh, and fauna, so you know like Tyrannosaurus in uh, you know uh, what do you call it the Hell Creek Formation area. And, I was, you know, since being up here, I was like, you know, I really don't haven't explored the whole uh, like pre younger driest period, you know, that the the unknown history that is the uh, Paleolithic um, the Americas. And, uh, that, and that was one of the options. And I was like, perfect. This is great. This is uh, a project that will I, I will be able to justify embedding myself into this aspect of uh anthropology you know i guess you could throw a little bit of paleontology in there and um yeah and then of course being up here uh you know you just for reference all i it, it, i mean well you know you lived in the same region as i did it's if you've never been up here it's like going back in time uh because very quickly you can walk out and be right in the heart of the chugach mountains and go like oh this is this is what people saw when there was no people here. Like this is, this is really intense. The fact that people like lived and resided for thousands of years in this region is kind of insane. And then you put on top of like, imagine coming across from like leaving the Siberian steppe through Beringia, crossing through Alaska and then down the, I guess, you know, like 
eventually like South America. Like that's insane. That's such a, just a, 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 a ridiculous, that's like kind of like, I would say even crazier than like the concept of us going to Mars now, you know, like, it, cause there, there was no support system. Like it was like, you, people are going to die. Like, you know, you're going to die. And then you throw the megaphone on there, like the short faced bear. And, you know, you've got the giant bison. You've, of course, you know, everybody knows the, 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 the mammoths that were coming across and all that kind of stuff. Um, let alone like the cave lions and the American cheetahs and it goes on and on. just all these animals that are just so insane by even today's stand, like the closest thing you have is like maybe the savannas of Africa, but those are like nerfed by comparison of like, the craziness i mean like have, have you ever seen a woolly rhino it's just insane that that thing even existed not that long ago um so there was just so many different factors as an artist that you get to play with plus it already like it was in my wheelhouse of interest it was kind of one of those where i was like yeah of course whatever you want to do let's let's do it uh, my, my only thing was like if we're gonna do it i my big thing is i just wanted to make sure that we did it where we were paying respect to the people. Cause so many times like things get like, uh, like whitewashed, I feel, or they get like, uh, I don't know, like the, the research isn't like even the bare bones research isn't done on certain things. And so like, there's nothing worse for me uh, where you're watching a film and like something that would like a dinosaur movie. Dinosaur movies are the easiest, right? At this point, like there's so much dinosaur, uh, like golden age of paleontology, right? And so there's so much like scientific data that's right there that's presentable for like people like us, right? They're non, we're not scientists. That's just right there for us to digest. And Hollywood, some a lot of times will just ignore all that and they'll be like, ah, Jurassic Park dinosaurs. That's what people want. I'm like, no, yeah. no. So uh I, I like the idea of like, okay, we let's let's try and get like the the whatever region the our, our characters are in, let's try and get the the fauna correct. Like, let's get that. Let's get that down. And that way, like, you know, at least we can, we, you know, even, you know, it's speculative history, right? Like it's speculative nonfiction in a weird sense. So uh, as long as we can get some of these aspects right. And, you know, the craziest thing is um, like, like, because Reddit and I've been picking up these books for a while. And when I would bring some of these advanced copies up here and I would go and do like, say like a, I'd go to Bosco's and, and, you know, they'd have like a little event. And so I'd bring some of them to sell or I would, uh, they, now we now have a comic con up here that happens once a year uh, in Anchorage called Arctic con. And so I would have like last year, I think I, or maybe two years ago, I think I had the first issue, some advanced copies of the first issue. And like the most beautiful thing about the project is I had, um, I would have Alaska natives come up, and they would go, oh, man, this is great. Like, it's nice to see some representation in the comics. Because, you know, like, there's not a lot of, like, comics that showcase that journey of of their heritage. You know, these, these are people that they have a bloodline connection to directly. And so, like, that doesn't get showcased very often. Like, it's it's one of those kind of forgotten genres. Like, I feel like in the 50s and 60s, there was a lot of, like, uh, prehistoric caveman type comics, but it was, you know, very, um, uh, it was that had that 50 cartoonish. Yeah. Yes. Cartoon. Yeah. Saturday morning to cartoon, you know, it was like, everyone's a troglodyte with a big stone hammer and they're just running around and they look like Brad Pitt and stones. Right? Yeah. Or they look, they look like, you know, Brad Pitt or something running around like with a loincloth, like, Oh, you know, Some and it's like stones type, uh, you know, yeah, it's just it was driving so, around on rocks and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then they throw a dinosaur in there, which, you know, is like just nonsensical. And so I think for um, at least in this region, the book like gets a really nice pop because people get it you know they're like oh yeah and so i'll be really it'll be really interesting to see as we progress through the issues how that response resonates um but uh you know we can talk about that yeah know, yeah you know, no I, I think that's beautiful and i could not agree with you more I, I think getting you know someone from that a native from that region to come look at it and say yeah. how the way that you're representing my ancestors is uh is amazing. Right. And, uh, I mean, what, what more could you ask for from a comic book that's trying to do just that? Right. I think that's absolutely incredible. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and I was really lucky enough, um, cause there's not a lot of comic pros up here. There's, there's just a handful of us. 
and uh, there was a native group that was starting up and they wanted to do native comics by native creators. Right. And so uh, it was called fish head soup had some um, local grants from the museums uh, programs up here. And, but they didn't, you know, they were like, well, we need, we need some, a consultant for like independent pub like publishing and things like that. So they brought me in. So I actually, actually got to sit down and like be on these zoom calls and, and meet, uh, you know, a bunch of like native creators and have like conversations about like what they wanted to see in comics, in storytelling and what their goals and stuff were. And it was such an eye opening experience. Cause I'm, I'm just, I'm just the, you know, my background is like, I think I'm Slavic. I think, I don't really know, you know, like it's, lost to the tides of history you know my heritage so it was really kind of cool to be in a group of people uh that were they they knew what their heritage was they wanted to explore that they wanted to talk about the athabascan cultures they wanted to include uh the, their stories while also creating new stories building off of for the next generation of kids coming out of some of these villages so you know like that was just such a like oh we're doing you know it, it was it was is validating because like Oh, we're doing the right thing with the first Americans. Like we're, you know, cause we're not, I, I don't know about you, Chris, but I'm not, you know, I'm not native. So like my big worry was like, I, I want to make sure that we're, we're doing this right. Just mm -hmm. as you know, I don't want to like be whitewashing anything. And um, I don't, I've, at this point, I don't think we have, you know, like it's been nothing but positive reviews and just over every people been over the moon. So I, I can't be happier. It's like, we hit all of our goals and we're just starting out like, and that never happens. You know, there's always usually people that are, upset that you didn't do something or you didn't include something and it's like uh, i've gotten z i've gotten zero of that so yeah. we've done a little bit of that online but um really you yeah. know there, every positive there's like a negative um but you can see why sure. tad was perfect for this project and why i wanted him to work on it and i think i think us uh how we deal with the story and the characters it's respectful and it's in good faith and we're showing how like brave these people were. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's all a positive book. We're showing them in a good light. Yeah. It, it's how I took it anyway, as a reader, right? I mean, it, again, I'm not native, so obviously that's going to be a different, much different perspective, but I felt like it was such a, a an amazing way to honor these people. Like you said, uh, Chris and Tad, that what they went through <laughs> to move from Siberia, just through all of the Americas, even down to the amount of death and carnage that took place. I, I don't think people realize how gruesome life was during that time. I mean, the average, I, I mean, you probably know, Chris, I, when you were studying and looking at the research, I mean, the average lifespan of somebody during that time could not be more than what, mid 20s? Low, low. And 30s, yeah. maybe? And I mean, it was, you're, you're coming off the ice age. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not like it's all sun, sunny outside and nice, you know, yeah. you're, you're, you're fighting to survive. And, you know, in the story, they follow a pack of mammoths that are migrating over too. Mm -hmm. And that's what kind of you have to do. You got to follow your food. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't easy. You're dealing with all these forms of animals that you've might not ever seen before that are in North America uh, bears that are twice the size, you know, <laughs> saber tooth cats, you know, your cat that you just got to add, like thing was huge with, yeah. you know, trying to kill you every night. <laughs> Incredible. Was there one thing, Chris, that during your research that you found to be the most unique? Um, I think the thing that kind of popped up to me that was like my favorite is when they started domesticating wolves around this time. Okay. I, I mean, I'm a big dog person. Uh, I know Tad has a dog too. So I was like, this is perfect, right? You know, he just has to draw his dog in a giant wolf form. Um, and so it was interesting learning of like how they started domesticating wolves, how there were some, um, you know, you basically had a few wolves that had some evolutionary things where they're not as scared to approach a human. Um Normally they would just attack or run, but a few would go, okay, I can get food from this thing. And if I just follow it around enough, uh, maybe it won't kill me. And being able to go into North America, and if you have a wolf with you, 
that can alert you when a saber tooth cat's coming around the corner, you it'd be easier to go into these new lands. Yeah. So I thought that was really interesting. You know, now I have a corgi and it's like seeing it from here to this little little cute dog. It's you know, it I it's incredible that we have kind of this connection to animals. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah that, that whole... that the next time my dog is barking at the front of the door, <laughs> I'll think yeah. twice before saying stop it, right? I'm sorry, Tia, what were you going to say? Oh, it's just the, the, the whole symbiotic relationship between uh, canine and, uh, I guess, the human species. It's interesting because, like, I've read some papers where they've speculated that that may have been one of the things that allowed people to spread out uh, as fast and as, as widely versed mm -hmm. across the 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 planet and you know because without the canine like you said like we're not ex you know we're not we're crafty but we're not exactly like very well equipped in terms of like we're visually impaired compared by to most animals you know to most to most mammals so like the idea of having dogs is is incredibly beneficial especially once you get into the northern hemispheres right you know like you start bringing in the you know like wolves or which eventually became i guess you could argue malamutes and uh you know i I mean, that's what I have. And like, I've ran into it a few times just up here because uh, I'm an idiot. And so I like to not so much this year. I had a, I've had a few close encounters with wildlife out here and having, you know, a, you know, a big Malamute that you're like, just cut off the leash and like, okay, please distract so I can get away. Uh, and, you know, it's, it, it saved my bunions a, a few times. I'm not going to lie. Uh, <laughs> you know, because, you know, up here we still have, you still have the the remnants of some of that. You still have moose and, you know, brown bears and all that kind of stuff, stuff that was running, running around back at that, the time that we're, you know, that's depicted in First Americans. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. I, and all of that, what you gentlemen are talking about really comes to life in both of these issues. Um, maybe we could kind of just go over if that's okay. Let's go over the first issue. Um, this is the Burring Strait. Um, and this takes place, right? That's from that Siberia into kind of that Alaska area, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember correctly. Yeah, we're starting in Siberia. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Where li life's very difficult. <laughs> I mean, it's still cold there, right? Can you imagine what it was 14,000 years ago coming out of the Ice Age? Oh, my God. You know, I mean, frozen. And you're trying to kill these mammoths. And, you know, uh, they, they they started evolving their weapons, too, around this time. Mm -hmm. You know, your normal spear, you're trying to kill a mammoth. It's not that effective. So you have to. That's why they, they call it Clovis Point um, once they start. Yeah start trying to evolve it so it can penetrate a mammoth a lot better, right? So it's just interesting to see how humans started adapting. And and these Clovis points are what they started finding in America and started carbon dating and going, okay, maybe there were people here way before than when we thought. Incredible. Yeah, that's actually kind of one of the things we've ran into, right, with the book is that what people don't realize is that right now is like the golden age for archaeology paleontology and so right now they're they keep pushing the timetable back uh just because they keep like they just had the it was always, there was a few like there's been a few sites that speculate that people were operating earlier but then like the white sands uh there was the footprints down the white sands and there was like seeds embedded in those footprints and so now it's like well were there people here even earlier uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know about you, Chris, but I ran into an actual a anthropologist who's buying the book uh, in Seattle, and uh, it started a very interesting conversation because uh, he, he he liked what we were doing, but he's like, well, you know, there's you know, got into that debate like, well, people could have been. A I, I run into the white sands argument, um, yeah, because I've read I read the article when it first came out, and it's yeah, very, yeah, it's it's actually very speculative, right? Sure. Because they're carbon dating, not the footprints, but the stuff around the footprints. Yeah, because so you can't, you, there's no, there's, carbons only exist in like plant material. Um, a lot of people think that you can't, you can't carbon date rocks, right? You just, you can't, there's no, there's no carbon to date. Yeah. So, yeah. so if you're walking around, you can find any time period in white sands if you want, right? If you right. test, test where you want. Um, 
And even one of the one of the archaeologists in the paper goes, I don't think this is conclusive. You know, no, no, and none of so, it. And that's what it's so beautiful about science, right? Is like none of it is. It's all like maybe we need more evidence. You know, more evidence. So when I was doing the research for this, you know, the Clovis point argument. Um, yeah, okay. So Sierra Madre, they find a Clovis point with in, in mammoth skeletons. So that's yeah. good. And then you have all these different sites throughout America that have these Clovis points. And then if you go east, there's there's more sites with modified versions of the Clovis point and different different type of weapons and tools. So you know when you do this research, you have a few different places you can point to, yeah. where it's everyone who's super on the white sands thing goes this book's wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. And it's like, did you read the article? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's not definitive. It's just, it's one of those things like it, it makes for interesting conversation. Like I, I like that kind of stuff. I love the, the, I guess the scientific discussion, you know, and that's, what's kind of great about the book is that it opens that door for like, I mean, I don't know about you. I don't get, I don't get access to a lot of like scientific people you know what i mean like i just i don't get to have those conversations and the fact you're, that they want to discuss the, it as close as i've been in probably ever <laughs> scientific <laughs> person just to give you an idea <laughs> yeah um i know there was uh there was a girl a girl's body they found in south america in a cave underwater and, oh yeah 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 and they couldn't get the exact carbon dating but you know part of them some of them were like this is older than fourteen thousand years ago some were like ah, oh, we just can't yeah. she's she's been on submerged underwater for like ten thousand years so but that's still you could go okay people came down from north america and they went down there right. um there's other theories that people were taking boats you know from yeah Asia, the, the boat theory is really interesting like right like they were cultures that were sea like uh I guess like shallow seafaring like fishermen that just rode the coastline all the way down. Cause during the, I mean, that's part of the problem with why they don't North America is such a mystery, right? Is that because the water levels rose, most of those sites are underwater. They're under seawater, which is just completely all that's gone. Like all, you know, all, all those, all those potential villages and hunting sites and stuff are, are all just underwater at this point, you know, by, 20 feet unfortunately uh which so, makes you makes you wonder right <laughs> yeah so so i get challenged on that a lot you know yeah I mean, on my sci-fi projects the same deal you know it's like this is really insane. how can you how can they try and debate i can understand debating first americans but on the sci-fi books really oh a lot of the sci-fi books yeah um Interesting. i mean i'm by like jpl and nasa and stuff so like i'll have some engineers and be like this is impossible and it's like the, the whole point is for you to figure it out you know <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> now now as far as kind of those folks that have a scientific background questioning do you think that's been better for the book and do you enjoy that i mean i think it sparks up a lot of great conversation um, but I don't know if you see it that way, or is it more frustrating? Like, I'm just trying to tell an amazing story in, and you guys are going in an area that we were never really intending. In person, it's fine. I mean, the sci-fi, I get more of the rudeness, uh, but for like the first Americans, it's a lot more positive. Um, it's online. The online snipers are the the ones that are just like, but there, this is impossible, you know? I mean, that's, I mean, that's internet culture, right? Like it's the yeah. worst. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's uh, the one thing i think got worse during the pandemic is that yeah of, right so, yeah so, I, I i would say like all my reactions are it always just sparks conversation i mean they still buy the book and are still super complimentary so like i guess if they really disliked what we were doing you know or like really disagreed they wouldn't be buying it but it it, it always just is like a nice conversation like it's never uh i wouldn't even say it would go as far as a debate it's always just a conversation because they'll be like oh do you guys know about this site or like there's some site I forget. I think it's up in Canada where they found something really strange. Like it was like an arrangement, but they can't decide. But it would push the timetable so far back. Um, I, th I think it's called like Bluefin Caves or something like that. Hmm. Um, and uh, but you know it's highly debated. Some people think it's like oh this shows evidence that people were in the Americas way earlier. Uh, but then at the same time, there's no surrounding 
sites that have been found. So it's like, could have been a natural formation. It's like highly contested amongst, you know, the, the scientists were, you know, I just find it all interesting. It's like, Oh yeah, sure. Let's talk about it. But the one thing it's like, well, we're still playing by the rules. Like this is definitive science. So we know that we're, we're running with, so everything else is being contested. It's all being debated. So, um, so and we're still operating in the gold. It's so, it's so far back that it's, it's like, Oh, of course I can't get everything right. Were you there? <laughs> no, like it, it was 14,100 years ago, Chris, not 14,000. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Before Christ, after Christ, but what, which of the, yeah. <laughs> Now, in the research part of it, right, you, you're starting in Siberia, you're working way down to South America. Have you done all the research for the amount of issues that you have planned for this? Or are you continually doing research as that trek down through Canada, through today's uh, U.S.? Are, are you doing more of that research as you go? Or do you feel like the story I want to tell with the research I did is exactly what I'm going to stick with. And there's nothing really new that I would make any major changes. So I, I did all the research I could and I have, I have the whole story outlined okay. um, and kind of ready to go. Tad sent me a few more research, uh, a few more bridge, articles. Bridge where, of the gods, listeners, bridge of the gods. It's yeah. the coolest thing in the world. Anyways, continue. sorry, Chris. So, so I can add a few elements here and there, but um, you know, there's nothing that's, uh, I'm really going to be able to discover that will completely like alter the storyline. I, I know where it's going. So yeah. that's awesome. And do we know about how many, like, I don't want to get too far ahead, right? We have, we have this one right here, which I think is absolutely gorgeous. And I mean, if I could, I'd love to, hopefully it doesn't give anything away, but I mean, it's absolutely no, you're good. beautiful. Yeah. Um, it's just gorgeous. But do you, do you know how many issues will be, um, in this series or is it going to be ongoing for the foreseeable future probably uh you know seven or eight yeah. you know seven eight nine it it kind of depends uh once once again it goes to like my style of not being like it has to be 24 page issue so then x number of issues um you know D diamond thinks it's eight so that's where they keep marketing uh but <laughs> somewhere somewhere around there there's a definitive endpoint. Um, you know, you can kind of expand afterwards a little bit more. You know, when they, when people start becoming more domesticated and they settle down and they start, you know, growing crops instead of gathering, just gathering crops. Um, how the the wolves, you know, you kind of evolve the wolves and you start breeding the wolves. Um, and then they can take care of some of the cattle, right? The bison and the cattle, you you can start like actually, you know, start a farm and all that kind of stuff. So so there's like a lot of really interesting points in human history after this traveling. Um, and then you have a lot of people go, go more like East Coast too. But yeah. there's no plan on doing that yet. Well, you know, we'll, we'll see. I'll just... Uh, Try to get at least eight chapters out of Tad here. <laughs> at least, right? Yeah, yeah. We just got we got to get through this story first before we get into the farming, right? <laughs> exactly. You know, um, chapters uh, three and four they're they're pretty long. They're probably about forty pages each. Um, so, as I said, I I don't like to stick to just the twenty two pages. I feel there's there's a lot I can deal with uh, this story, and you know it. Basically, for chapter three, the guy's lost. He get, he gets lost. So it's about you know when you're back then how you navigate the stars and how you get back to an area if you get lost, right? So these people always kind of had you know they had um, caches. That was part of my research too. They'd have like little stash. You know they'll have like a stash of food and tools. They'll leave they'll bury it and leave it there. In case they get lost, they can come back to it and have some supplies. So it was really interesting on how they would do that. Yeah. Oh, it sounds awesome. It sounds amazing. I, I would love to kind of get into um, the the decision um, to not use words, because yeah. I, I do think that's important for people to know the style of story um, that this is. 
And it works perfect for the story that you're telling, by the way, at least in my <laughs> eyes, I love it. Um, but can you kind of talk about why that was important for this particular story? That was kind of a challenge because uh, I did some research on the language too. And since it's so far back, you have so little uh, to go off of. And I just kind of went with, it would be minimum, um, more kind of like grunts and directions. Um, so there's maybe like one line in the first chapter. I mean, it's just very minimal. Um, so I thought that would be a better approach. And, you know, Space Dragon, I had no dialogue. Like I'm used to working with no dialogue stories. Um, so I thought that would be the best approach instead of like they're sitting in the cave and there's this huge conversation and another huge conversation like, no, this isn't a superhero book and it's not any of that kind of stuff. It's, you know, they're, they're on instincts. They just follow like a tribe leader, you know, not a lot of discussion, just a lot of instinct, a lot of instinctual elements. Yeah. And then Ted, from your perspective as an artist, is it easier or harder to uh, do the art for a comic book where a lot of words or I guess the direction from Chris, as far as how he visualizes a story go, would be the same whether there's words or not, or how different is it? I guess I, I'm asking. Um, I, you know, I I come from a, an old school of practice. I went to the Cuber school when like Joe was still um still the, like still with us and teaching, and uh, so I grew up uh or not grew up but like i studied under guys that like storytelling comes first the words shouldn't dictate the story um so like i did a book called um cretaceous for oni and that was completely silent um and like as just a storyteller one of my goals is i want to i don't care if it's superheroes it or if it's something like first americans uh, i a reader should be able to read the story visually without having to read the dialogue in my opinion um you know it comes a little bit more complicated with like slices of life or dramas or crime noirs or something like that but still like you know like if i flip through a comic and i can't get an idea of a, a basic fundamental understanding of like the direction of the story then to me the comic that the comic artist has failed as a storyteller um like it's a visual medium so just like a film you know, if you need dialogue to tell the reader what's happening, then you probably aren't telling a very like good story. Like you're not taking advantage of the medium. And so uh, I tried to, you know, like for me, it was like, great. Uh, just, it gives me more room to tell the story. Like, uh, and you know, like using body language, like, yeah, these are ancient peoples, but at the same time, like ancient, they weren't much different than they're the same as you and I, right? Like they're very articulate. They're very smart, obviously. You know, like just you had to be just to survive at that time. Right. So um, being in an environment like that, that's incredibly hostile, like they're going to be using sign like signing. They're going to be using body language to indicate like, man, yeah, let's go over this way. Let's go this way. Um, and, uh, you know, like that, that that's the kind of stuff that like I try to incorporate into my art in general, like nothing makes me happier that when I finish a comic and the writer goes like, oh, yeah, the body language or the storytelling was great. Um, I'm just going to eliminate a bunch of the di like a bunch of the dialogue here or a bunch of the narration um, that happened. That I I've been lucky enough that like, yes, I'm not a perfect artist, like, far from it. Um, but very early in my career, that was something that I, you know, I was like, OK, my strength is the storytelling. Um, even if I have weaknesses in other areas. So like, even like my, one of my first books was like a dark horse book. And, you know, the best compliment I got from the whole thing was the writer was like, and the editor was like, well, why don't we go through and eliminate like a lot of the dialogue so that the, because we don't need it. Like Ted did a good job with the storytelling, which I was like, okay, all right. Like, that's my thing. Like I could, I can tell the story. Okay, good. You know, if, not to compliment myself, but um, yeah. And so it just, it just, it was, it just played nice that. And also like, um, a story like this, it doesn't need to like issue two. There's some dialogue, uh, you know, there's some, there's a meeting of the the elders where they're deciding what they're going to do. Um, and so there, there's some discussion that happens. Yeah. Um, but also like, if you're a guy, if you're like an individual that's out in the wilderness, you don't want to be noisy. You don't want to be loud, especially if you're reliant on your next meal coming from hunting, you're going to be quiet. Like, you know, like, 
because essentially you're in the permanent your stock mode you know like um you don't i don't know i like when i go out into the mountains like i'm not i don't take my bluetooth speaker and blast the music um and everything because i actually want to like experience and like nothing better is when you're in a natural like up on a bluff or you're in a ravine and there's like a natural blind and all of a sudden like a, you know a 1500 pound moose comes cruising through and doesn't even see you like that's one of the best experiences that most people never get to uh even have in a lot in their life and the fact that we can convey that in in the book uh like there's a scene also in issue two vong or chapter two uh where uh clovis our, our main guy you know he's sitting across the river watching the 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 mammoths that he's uh he's the pachyderms that he's following um and they don't even know he's there he's just sitting there just being quiet being as small as possible um and just observing they're out there doing their thing because you know and he's just observing to see where they're going to go you know like just following their path uh and, and and you know like elephants they do that right like that's that's what they do is they create natural highways for 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 other animals to follow so it'd be just natural that a human in my opinion would do this take that same approach you know um but yeah anyway because that's my long-winded answer i guess to that question <laughs> <laughs> you know what's interesting is uh the skill set and uh how humans were under constant stress at least that's what i get out of the first two issues right because you are trying to be quiet. You are on the constant hunt for your next meal because not every day that meal is going to come. You could go a few days where you're trying to hunt your next yeah. meal, right? Um, that constant stress on a human, like we, I don't think very many humans experience that anymore, right? Because even if I'm having a stressful day, I could leave and I could go to my room and I could read a comic book and, and be in a whole nother world for a half hour or whatever. I mean, that experience, right? And how it's being portrayed through the story, I think is something that I gathered as well, because that's not my experience anymore, right? I mean, I don't think humans have that experience anymore. At if, least if you, if you twist your ankle, yeah. like you get a normal twisted ankle, you might be done. Yeah, you yeah. know, you might be done. Yeah. You know, hey, a um, minor injury and you get an infection, or hey, sorry, you just can't keep up. You twisted your ankle yesterday. Goodbye. You know, or falling we off move. like a heel and breaking a leg. I mean, the the oh, you break a leg, you're right? Done. I mean, you can't do anything with that, right? You're done. No, yeah, you're, you break a femur. Oh, God forbid, the bone breaks the epidermis. You're you're screwed. Like that's it. Game over. Infection setting in within twelve. You know, twelve twenty four hours. You're dead, but it is interesting. You're, you're, you're tapping into an interesting kind of like psychological paradox of like what it means to be human, right? Like, um, is, uh, do you ever see the documentary happy people by Herzog, Werner Herzog? Mm -hmm. Yeah. With the in, people a in, in a while. Yeah. yeah but they're like two that was written about it too. Right. I or think so. A collection of studies, I think maybe. Yeah. But like the documentary is really interesting. Cause it's like, these are supposedly some of the happiest people in the world, but they exist on the edge of, the Siberian wilderness. Right. And, um, they just hunt and they trap and they have their trap lines that they run. And it's very hard, hard. Cause like when you get in this region, everyone thinks that there's just wherever you look, there's just herds of animals just all over the place. Come to Alaska. You'll just see just billions of moose just cruising around. Not the case. Uh, you know, like, I don't know how many people I've talked to that spent all this money. They did the path, the explorer pass to go to Denali and then they hike around for three days and it's just, they don't see anything. And it's like, yeah, cause it's vast. It's huge. It's not like being in Manhattan, which Manhattan's only what, like three and a half miles long. It's not that big, really. It, like, I remember the first time I went there, I was like, this is it. It's the big apple. It's kind of small. Like I've been to mountains that are way bigger. <laughs> like this is, uh, you know, <laughs> the only difference is there's 9 million people living on top of each other. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, wow, I've, I've never seen so many the vertical people. space. Yeah, exactly. yeah, it's like so many people in such a small space, and then you come like to a place like Alaska, and you're like, oh, geez, like it's you might the only thing you'll see for all day is a magpie, you know, and you're just walking. Um, but it, it is an interesting paradox of like, you know, yeah, that was a shorter, harder life, but I don't know about you. When I get out there, sometimes I'm like, I could see it. I could see just disappearing into the the mists of a time out on the tundra and just never coming back. Cause it, I don't know, there's something about it. Like, uh, you know, it was that whole thing of like, um, 
you, like when colonists uh, were first come into the America, like North America, and you very you never had uh, in, like indigenous people leaving their villages to go into like any of the thirteen colonies and become a person, but it was very common that you would get colonists who would be come become friends or become part of a village and they would leave uh western the, their western culture for i mean like you had or like the mountain men of the early americas before manifest destiny and uh you would have these these you know there's maybe like 13 14 of them you know like your jeremiah johnson or your kit carson and like the only people they interacted with were uh different native villages and, you know, like, and they would take, you know, they would marry into, into the tribes and, uh, you know, they would have offspring with, with wives from the village, things like that. It, you know, it was, uh, it was really, really interesting how, I don't know, it, it makes you wonder, like, is our hustle and bustle that is so dominant today, is that, is this really how we we're supposed to live? Or were we supposed to only just 30 years of just burning bright, surviving on the edge of, of existence in, in some like, just beautiful, harsh environment. Just, yeah. you know, maybe that's what we're really built to do. I mean, obviously we're living in, you know, <laughs> a technological filled world, but uh, I don't know. There's something about it. Maybe I'm just romanticizing. I mean, I mean, things like language and written, you know, written language is unnatural to us. And right. like, that's why you'll have kids who have trouble reading and stuff. It's, it's cause you, our brains don't evolve that fast they don't evolve yeah. that fast over a thousand years you know with writing so um yeah we're in kind of just a different time yeah. and yeah. yeah it's almost like we're moving too fast like we're still occupying this like primal vehicle where we, we're all at some sense are like we're, we're geared to like get out there and just survive right but we've are, are trying to adapt rapidly to this fast changing. Well, well it's like our wisdom world. teeth, right? You, you now you get your wisdom teeth taken out. You know the dentist, right? Like you don't need this this crap anymore, man. You're not chewing on nuts, and <laughs> you don't need those yeah. back teeth. I am I, I, that you know now you're making me not to like obviously we're going down this rabbit hole here. <laughs> that makes me wonder like what what dentistry and stuff looked like back then but then again or did people need it because i've also heard the argument that like well if you look at a lot of these um you know these these dig sites these ancient peoples that they'll find like their teeth aren't like they're they're not they're not fucked up they're not all they're not cr overly crowded they're not rotting and i think a lot of it's just because the diet was I, yeah. was very very was very basic you know was, no you know, no buffalo soda you know yeah, no, no no it was a hundred like you want to get like you know what was the paleo diet this is like the real paleo yeah. <laughs> diet you know like yeah we're like a berries berries are dessert and there's it only comes at a certain time of the year and it's the only time that you're getting the surplus of sugar Right. That's it. You know, uh, which so you weren't just like, well, I go down to the convenience store. I'm going to get myself some juicy fruits and uh, it'll be great. You know, like that didn't exist. Like it's so interesting. I, there's so many facets to it. You know, obviously you could tell why Chris and I are like, oh, this book's still you know, so much fun to work on. It's so interesting. Well, I mean, it is yeah. interesting. Right. I mean, you just think about our diet. Like you said, paleo diet was the legit diet 14000 years ago. Um, but, you know, what we put in our body really affects how we behave, how we think, how we develop, yeah. all these different things, right? And you, I can't even imagine what it would be like 14,000 years ago where your diet was just as pure of a diet as wow. it gets, right? I mean, you're eating what you hunted and you're hoping that you're going to be by a stream to be able to wash that thing down wow. once in a while. But, I mean, the simplicity, and I wonder what, if that isn't what was a, is attractive, um, to people, um, yeah. and why people look at that life and people who live that life, even to a, a smaller extent today, why they're considered a happier people is because everything that they put in their body makes them healthier. Um, I don't know. I just think there's a lot of, in the simplicity, even though the life is hard, it's a much simpler life, right? I mean, I, you're yeah. looking at your phone for your next conference call or your deadline. I mean, it's just and crazy how many places your brain has to be. But in this time, when I'm reading this, they are a hundred percent focused on their survival and their next meal. Right. And the protect yeah. the clan or the tribe that they're part of. I mean, it seemed like it was a much simpler life. And I think because of that, you would be a lot happier, even though it was a harsh life and maybe a short life. Yeah. And I think there was like a level of like, 
because your your survival was so dictated by what the elements provided um that there was probably a much healthier respect um for the environment that you lived in and uh we're now you know like it is interesting that you know you mentioned the phone it's like we spend so much time even like even com the whole construct of comics right it's entertainment we spend so much time trying to occupy ourselves with entertainment where um and it that shows that like oh we're this this world that we've created for ourselves in the last four thousand years we're, we're bored you know like as a as a as a species we're bored because this is not this is like Chris said earlier, uh, we're it's a very unnatural. It's a very unnatural environment. Cities are like you know I hear people talk about like you know when you talk about pollution and stuff like that, and it's like yeah, well cities shouldn't even exist. It's like the biggest like unnatural artifact on the planet, and they're all over the damn place. <laughs> like you know like they should not be there. Uh, yeah, it, it's a really interesting paradigm when you start i guess exploring the you know my my, my sister hates it because i was trying to do these conversations with her and she's like i don't uh, god more existential bullshit god, <laughs> god stop please stop but you know it, it is such an interesting aspect of like as a species especially uh psychologically like what what were we geared to do it was, was like like was this like was this where we were supposed to stop is this where we we're supposed to maintain like be in this world this like ancient time so yeah. like color, um, you know, in the next chapter, we have them trying out different like fruits and stuff and like one's poisonous and the other's not. And the human brain, you look at the color, like the color red pops out to us a lot. Like our yeah. brains go, look for red because you're looking for fruit that you can eat. So that's why your stop sign's red, because that's the first thing you can see. That's the first thing that kind of like grabs your attention. Yeah. Um is, is stuff like that. So we're in this, like, that's why kids eat Tide Pods because, you know, there's something in their head that goes, oh, th this might actually be good, you know? like I mean, they look like good. They I'm look not going to eat one, but they do look good. They, all they look good, stuff. but that's your brain <laughs> of thousands and thousands of years going like, I need to look for cherries and I need to look for strawberries. I need to look for like these types of vegetables and fruits. Yeah. Yeah, that's ah, that's a really interesting point. That like, yeah, you think about it, like, why are we attracted to these bright colors? And it's probably through like association with flowering plants that, and flowering plants usually produce fruits of some kind. Um, yeah, that's a real ah, that's a really good point. And then that comes into the whole aspect of like that the relationship between flora and fauna. Like fauna has evolved to be vibrant to attract whether it's like even just the pollen like it's colorful so people are going to come over smell it touch it grab it that pollen's attaching to you without well without you being aware and then you wander off and you're pollinating you know the you know whatever what's it called gym or whatever i can't even remember the term but my biology my biology knowledge is and the and the people who could identify those colors were the ones that survived more most often yeah yeah do you think what would be more shocking for one of us to be placed 14,000 years ago or for someone 14,000 years ago to be placed in today's time? You know, that is a really interesting construct. Uh, I uh, years ago was playing with a short story of that. And, um, you know, I think the knee jerk, because we're more comfortable as people in the you know the time period we are now i think like if you look in the past there's been a lot of stories of like ancient man goes through a time portal and then all of a sudden he's oh bewildered as he comes through a manhole cover and is in you know modern day manhattan and there's cars and like oh look at these electronic beasts you know spewing fumes it but i could be honest i think um that person given enough time would probably be like, well, this is really easy. Uh, yeah. This is really, Oh, Ooh, like, you know, like even if you dropped him and say like, uh, you know, like hard, the hard New York, 1985 muggers on the street. Hey man, give me your wallet. I'm pretty, I think the club is due to be like, <laughs> okay. Ooh, ooh, scary. I really like that knife. I'm going to take it from you. And he probably would. Uh, Crocodile I think indeed, that's not a knife. This is yeah, I think you'd have a little bit of that. I think after a while, you'd probably get lazy. Like, uh, when I was a kid, I wrestled with a guy. He was one of the Lost Boys from Sudan. So he's a, a refugee, you know, and he came from, like, this very, like, 
you know, is a refugee camp, right? So it was like this, uh, this just this this village that was just hanging together, waiting to be these kids to be brought from this war torn area to you know like find like a um, like a host family, and um, this guy, you know, uh, his name was Pete. He he was amazing, you know, the Sudanese guy, like one of the toughest hombres I've ever met in my entire life. Sweet as can be, but like when he came over, I I mean, he was so tough. But then the more he was in like, oh, going to the grocery store, like, you know, like, you know, like he he had a story about surviving Nile crocodiles because they had to cross <laughs> a portion of the Nile to get to this refugee camp. Right. Yeah. Where like, you know, like he saw people die yeah. and uh, he fought in the Civil War at the age of like 13. And then like as he came here, it was like every year he even told me, he's like, yeah, I just keep getting like softer and softer. It's like easier. So I think it would be the reverse. I think if you took a person from reverse. now. And you put him that time period, you probably just go into the fetal position and die just from sheer shock because there's nothing. You're just completely cut off. You get a flat tire or your car breaks down, you know, like and you don't you don't know how to do like do anything. There's triple A yeah. like that happens that like like, you know, you're saying earlier, you you twist an ankle. You're done, man. Like You're, you're done. done. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean I just, I'm afraid for kids, kids who won't be able to follow basic directions you know <laughs> traveling directions they'll be like oh shit well my phone will take me there and it's like i <laughs> turn out this map quest thing and yeah. turn yeah, left well, at the rock and... the road atlas you remember the road yeah, atlas that had the maps of every state man i used to have one of those in my tr like my truck i still have in my trunk you know? yeah Just, the you case know. man you never know yeah it's exactly. funny is uh my you bring someone from fourteen thousand years ago and place them here you you feed them lays m m's and some pizza after about a year yeah. man they'll look like thor yeah like, yeah, they'll thor. like dude they'll be like <laughs> they'll be like this is great this is awesome like, yeah you know <laughs> this is i can't believe it the world's this big and this small at the same time this is great yeah, yeah where you go back then it's like Oh my God. Oh my God. Then you experience like, I don't know. Most people don't encounter animals that are bigger than them, especially being in North America, like, you know, because of manifest destiny, like all of your big, like majority, like majority of that, like, I guess, latent megafauna has been completely, like was completely wiped out by that expansion. Right. Like, so everything is nerfed. Your, your mountain lions, your, we're back then shit, man. Like, uh, a cave lion is bigger than a Siberian tiger. Like that's insane. That's like, Siberian true. tigers are freaking huge. You know, it's like a 600 pound cat. Yeah. Like that makes an African lion look small. And then you throw a ca American cave lion or heck just the, the American cheetah. Like, I mean, that, like people don't realize you see those, uh, you, you see the, what are they called? The, the antelope, you know, mm -hmm. when you're going through like the Dakotas and stuff, yeah. like those are all evolved to escape american cheese that's why they can run at like 60 miles an hour um but there's no somehow they they survived whatever happened during younger dryas so they don't really have any natural predators you know like because they're so fast nothing can touch them that's why they you know like my my sister was on a military base in uh in wyoming and the problem was is that there's too many of those dang things like they were all over all over the place um or yeah and they're not even actually antelope i think the the they're called pronghorn yeah. um yeah and like that right there is so interesting kind of plays into what you're talking about of like oh yeah for now for pronghorns it's easy yeah. they survive they survive from fourteen thousand years ago so it's like oh yeah no we still have all of our attributes we you know cheetahs show up again we could we got it we got it on lock <laughs> you know what they I mean? have the same problem uh -huh. in like montana that area where um you know horses have been released back into the wild and yeah. now over the last 15, 20 years, they've reproduced and they're so large and there's no predators. None. And so now they're just destroying everywhere they go because yeah. there's such huge herds. They're just eating everything. And so yeah. just destroying farmland. And now they're like, now what do we do? Right. You're going to have to thin that herd, but you know, it's a horse. So you don't want messages going around that there's guys out there hunting horses, right? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it's like it, it's done. a beloved animal. Yeah, yeah, I've got some friends here that work up in like Denali and stuff, and they'll tell me things about like, you know, you hear about problem bears. Yeah, and like the biggest problem is you'll get tourists will come in, they'll feed the bear or something, and the bears like they're smart animals. They're not just like these machines that survive. They're living, breathing, intelligent creatures, and so immediately they're like. 
oh wait if i just walk up to these people they'll throw like peanut butter jelly sandwiches at me just for me to go away oh well, i'm just I'll, well i'll just hang out here and wait for folks to come down the trail like this is great and so that and then that becomes an entire issue because then that gets regarded as like oh that's a problem bear it's attacking people no it's just yeah, we've created that issue for ourselves because somebody fed the bear and now he's like <laughs> ah this is way easier than trying to hunt stuff like oh, okay yeah, it's, I don't know. It's so fast. I, this conversation has been really great. Like I wasn't expecting this. This is awesome. Like, I love like, it, man. This I'm has been awesome these, because I, I feel yeah. like I jumped into First Americans and I've been able to taste a little <laughs> bit more of it. Like it's it's an amazing read. And uh, man, if anybody has not picked this up yet, um, absolutely incredible. Storyline is amazing. Artwork is amazing. Um, you should be reading this um, because it captures one, the imagination, right? Because I think we all want to know what it's like to live back there. And because you two gentlemen have done your research, I think this is about as close as we're going to get to what it was like back there. But, you know, Chris, back to you, if I could, man, just from a critical entertainment standpoint, right? We have the first two issues of um, the first Americans. Both of these are available, right? Uh, the first one uh, should be available in local comic book stores in a few weeks. It's supposed to come out this this week, but there's some delays. And then the first Americans number two, uh, it's supposed to come out May or yeah, May 22nd, May 22nd. Wow. And then I thought maybe real quick, uh, I'm traveling. So my uh, daughter had a baby. I live in California. She lives in Utah. So we're in Utah right now, but I did bring oh, some congratulations. of my... congratulations. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Grandfather, which is weird. Um, but I brought some of your other titles too. I thought maybe we could just walk through these, but so these titles yeah. are also incredible, right? So we have uh, oh, Life Boat, which is pretty that's, awesome. That, you want to give us a quick synopsis? Uh, Lifeboat's about uh, basically a space crew at the end of the universe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you're kind of dealing with the frozen end of time at the end yeah. of time. So it's a reverse of the first America. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll have to get Mason on too. Him and I have been going back and forth, but I got to get him on. But uh, uh, what's, oh, then this one, of course. And then Zombie Zero, right? We have the full graphic novel of it uh, about the last zombie at the end of a zombie apocalypse. Yeah. Kind of our first big graphic novel. Yeah. Um, and then we have Minion. That That's going to come out a little bit later this year through Diamond. Yeah. Basically about the the minions of a super villain. As they fight for control over the city. <laughs> and then this one right here. And then Planetary, which has been doing well, about a colony ship heading to a new Earth-like planet in another solar yeah. system. Yeah. So so that has the same type of exploration theme. So you can see, it's I like adventures. Characters too. I, I like adventure stories. So it, that's the that's the sci-fi first Americans, right? It's, you know, you there's some about us about we get wanderlust and we want to go travel you know i want people on mars i want us to go explore other planets you know you got to just step into the unknown yeah yeah and then are, what other titles am i missing i didn't have everything with me but uh is there anything that i was missing out of all these uh there's space dragon i think i got a copy space dragon here. Was one i haven't read yet so i'm gonna have to pick that one up next and there's space dragon this is a complete graphic novel it's about 100 pages uh we'd like to release this maybe like uh fall or winter this year beautiful so that's coming up and are you going to have any all of these will be available at wondercon um next week chris uh, while you're there pretty much everything's available at wondercon um you know i try to get people to order it through their stores first Absolutely. um but you know a lot of times their store won't have it so like everything's available on our website we ship things out to you uh it's critical entertainment la.com um and yeah we have WonderCon this week we'll be at san diego comic-con yeah. uh and then la comic-con i'm trying to get tad out to san diego that would be cool yeah that's worth coming yeah. out for tad san diego yeah i'm i need to start doing more cons i just uh you know you get locked up here and uh i, I don't know i'm always real shy about going to the cons i don't know why i just uh i, I get you know i love doing them but it's like the build up to them always make me like, oh man, there's just so much planning, so much stuff. I oh, I don't have this ready, I don't have that ready, so I'm always hesitant to do it. But I need to just go. I should just go, just to go, just to have fun. I think it would be good. It would. When, when is San Diego this year? When is that? Um, it's like uh, July something, twenty yeah. eighth, somewhere around there, twenty fourth or twenty eighth. Yeah. yeah. And so it's the end of July. Last one, right? I'm sorry, Dad. 
I was gonna say, so it's end of July. Yeah. 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 Okay. I might be able to make that. I'll. I'll we'll talk. We'll talk after. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking about maybe trying to do L.A. this year, um, because I've heard good things about that. Because that's like in November, right? Yes. Yeah, that's in December. Oh, I think they moved it back to October this year. October. Did they? Okay. Yeah, yeah I think they moved it back to October. Um, but that one's good. WonderCon and LA are kind of like on the same level, I would say. Okay. Uh, but San Diego is the real meat and potatoes. It's, um, a, it's just a beast. You yeah. know, I'd like I'd like to get out to New York um, and Chicago at some point, but, but it's just such a lo logistical nightmare. Yeah. Um, Especially with you're books. loading comic books and it's very costly, right? You got your stay. That's why San Diego is awesome if you live here, but traveling here, it's just so expensive. You really need to start booking now if you haven't, just because, you know, San Diego is such a destination for tourists that yeah. they know when all the big events happen and you'll see prices in hotels double um, during these uh, time frames just because they could do it, right? Oh, it's insane. Yeah. It's insane. insane. The cost is wow. crazy. So when I go to San Diego Com, I usually go for a day. Um, it's just so expensive. Um, so I, I live close enough where I could drive and then drive home afterward. And that works out perfect for me. But I feel bad for anybody that has to, like you, Chris, going to Chicago or New York. Uh, it's hard. I, you know, I, I do Emerald City uh, sometimes yeah. because at least, at least I can drive there. You yeah. know, a 14 yeah. hour drive, I can at least handle that. But yeah. doing doing Chicago, uh, it's a nightmare shipping all your books somewhere and having to pick it up and deal with all that. Then you then your costs, you know, you're eating into your your profit margins a lot. So, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you're going to be at um, uh, WonderCon. So I look forward to uh, stopping by the booth. Yeah, Mason, who's going to be with you? Is just you and Mason, or uh, yeah, Mason and myself. We'll yeah. be there. Sweet. We have and a few. Dad, I, I hope you come to San Diego so we can meet in person, man. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Love your artwork, man. It's incredible. Thank you. Oh, thanks. That means a lot. Uh, yeah, I'll be doing a few. I'll be, I, I'm doing, I'll be a guest at the, the Boise Arts Festival this oh, nice. year. I, I think it's end of August. And then I'm a guest at the, I don't know if it's announced yet, but next end of next month, there's the Arctic Con that happens here in Anchorage. I mean, that's an easy one for me. It's like 20 minutes away. Uh, those are uh, right now. Those are the only two cons that I'm a hundred percent doing. Uh, I might be doing, I might try and do some more later in the year. I don't know. It's just, you know, what, whatever the, I got to see what the schedule allows uh, a lot, a lot of stuff on the plate at the moment. So yeah, understood. Um, I, I do have a signing at golden apple uh, comics uh, April 20th too. So 20th. If, oh, nice. if someone's in the LA Hollywood area, yeah, I mean, it's go. such a, see, so April 20th, Apple. App, Golden Apple Comics. It's like the the big iconic uh, 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 here. comic book shop in LA for sure. So yeah, okay. so uh, the 20th. I'll write that. I'll put that in the the um, subject line with all the links um, to your website. Obviously, um, for some of the newer comic books, we'll put the diamond code. That way people could ask their, their stores to uh, pick that up. But gentlemen, um, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed our conversation. This has been the most educational thing I've done in a long time. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know about that. I don't know. <laughs> That's really sad. Take everything I say with a grain of salt, please. Yeah, I, am, no, no, I am not a scientist. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I think it was an amazing, fun conversation. Um, but yeah, if you're not if you're a collector or just an, an enjoyer of comic books, if you're not reading critical entertainment and all these amazing titles, you're just missing out. I mean, what's wrong with you? So uh, get over there to critical um, entertainment, um, la.net. Dot com. Dot com. Oh, and uh, pick up some of these titles. Com. Yeah. And yeah, go into your comic book shop and pre-order because they're, yeah. you know, got to, got to support the whole 100%. comic industry. hundred percent. Well, gentlemen, Thank you so much for joining me today. I absolutely loved it. And I hope we could do this again. Yeah, man. Just let me know. Yeah, I'm always available. <laughs> I love it. All right, Chris, Tad, have a good one. Pleasure. And uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks, Tommy. All right. Thank talk you. Soon. Thank you.